I am your host, Larry Zonka, and this is episode 10 of the 411 on Wrestling podcast. You can follow the show on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube, and of course on 411media.com through the embedded players. Please make sure to share us around, leave a five-star review on iTunes and other places, as we would appreciate it. It helps the show grow and gets us out to more people. And uh, today I am joined by my longtime friend and podcasting partner, as always, Jeremy Lambert Jr. the third. We are going to talk about a little bit of Raw and SmackDown, just a couple hit hit notes on those, and then we're going to break down the Impact United We Stand and G1 Supercard shows. Jeremy, how are you today? I am doing well. I appreciate you having me back on and more wrestling to talk about. This week is finally over. I feel like neither of us have slept in about 10 days. Yeah, it uh it certainly feels that way, man. The uh the mania week process is always a long one and um it like I said it got longer again this year. Too many shows. Um just uh Mainly for the fact that I feel really bad. There was just some stuff around that did not do good crowds, and I have no idea how they made money. I just hope everybody got paid. It's so. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's always a concern with uh, you running all these shows and all this independent talent and everything. Is some of the we know that a lot of these companies i don't know how profitable they are but they feel like they have to run during mania weekend and then you know some of these guys command bigger checks than than other guys and you you wonder all right well how much did you really get paid for doing all of this work uh yeah i don't know if we'll hear any stories about that but it's i'm sure it's a concern for some of the boys i think the only real saving grace for a lot of the companies are that like some of them will get the good brother friend rate. And the other thing is when you have guys like LAX and the Lucha brothers working like nine shows, you know, they're, they're going to be more willing to give some people a break. So they may not charge as much as they normally would. But again, it's like, I don't care who you are. I mean, you're still, if you run a show and you only draw 20 people, you know, you're you're gonna have a trouble paying, you know, Bob down the street just to come and work the show, let alone anybody with a name. So yeah, I just uh, like I said, I hope everybody got paid, but uh WrestleMania week finally, you know, comes to an end and um so real quick we had the we had the Raw and SmackDowns after uh after the big week and um kind of a mixed reaction on these shows this year. Um I know there's a lot of people that, you know, look forward to them every year. And it's kind of weird. I think a lot of people, I don't know if it's revisionist history or they just like want to be happy with them. But a lot of people are like, the shows weren't as great as they were in previous years. And I'm thinking that, I don't know to me, I don't think the post media shows are ever really that great. I think they're interesting. Um, You know, you get call ups and stuff like that. You get a hot crowd, but I don't know if they're ever really Great. But uh just a couple notes. We had uh Lars Sullivan finally uh made his long awaited debut on Raw. Uh he killed who the hell did he kill on Raw, Jim? He killed yeah, he Kurt Angle on Raw. Yeah. That's right. So he killed Kurt Angle on Raw and then he showed up on SmackDown and he killed the Hardys after they won the tag titles. And um apparently he was out with uh like his debut was pushed back because like depression issues and stuff like that, anxiety attack or something. But um, hopefully he's okay now. I thought Lars showed a lot of potential in NXT, and um, yeah. So what are you thinking they're gonna do with uh with the new big man on the roster here? Well, the report was that he was supposed to you know take out John Cena. Um, in January, and then yeah, he had anxiety, he had a panic attack apparently before that. So they've clearly got big plans for him. I mean, he is a Vince McMahon type of guy. He's a big guy. He's got a good look. He was a fine worker in NXT. Uh, it, 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 at least they have a plan for this guy, unlike most of these NXT call-ups. I mean, Heavy Machinery was dead on arrival 
EC3 is more than dead. Lacey Evans is finally doing something, but, you know, for the past four months, she just comes out and walks and leaves. Um, it, Lars Sullivan seems to be a guy. They were they were behind him pretty quickly with the whole push at Survivor Series, and then they turned into, oh, well, these guys are also getting call up. So I feel like they had a plan for Lars Sullivan. He attacks Kurt Angle on his first night. He attacks the Hardy Boys on his second night. That's a pretty good start. We'll we'll see where it goes, but he's off to a good start. I I, I feel we talked about in the WrestleMania post podcast that like they need to do something with baron corbin and basically what they did with baron corbin was give lars sullivan that push that corbin maybe should have had so corbin beating angle just feels like a complete waste and then angle gets his heat back on raw and then you just put that heat on lars sullivan so corbin got the win he's going nowhere with it so what a waste that was it certainly feels that way, and uh, you know I've seen enough of Lars and NXT and everything. I would much rather watch Lars Sullivan matches and Baron Corbin matches, but I totally agree. It does feel like a like a rather big waste because yeah, it's like he beat Kurt Angle, and then we we're like, you know, what are they going to do? Do you have a plan? And then he goes out there and he gloats, and that's fine. That's what a heel does. And then, like you said, Angle got his heat back. And then Lars kicked the shit out of Angle, and Baron Corbin was just a bitch. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, what what else can you say? Uh, maybe Corbin comes out of this with something better. I there, there's not much to inspire hope after what happened on Raw. Yeah, I and uh, you you brought up uh, Lacey Evans finally doing something, and there have been rumors for a long time that when she is ready to go they would be giving her a big push and she did angles with becky lynch on both shows uh monday was uh the big brawl and then tuesday was the follow-up where she got the stand tall so lacey evans and looks like to be becky lynch's first mate post mania program your thoughts it's a fine first feud i mean lacey evans has been rumored to apparently been having this push for a little while now so it's fine. Becky's got to do something. She can't immediately go back to Charlotte. She, you know, Rousey's got to take her time off. They they haven't really heated anybody up for Becky, which is more on them than anything else. Lacey, I wouldn't say she's like hot, but she also hasn't been losing a bunch of tag team matches and stuff. So she's just kind of, she's been there. She's been walking out, walking back and that's it. So she hasn't been killed to, uh, which is more than you can say for most of the women's roster. That's a fair point too. And that's, again, like you said, it's on them because they really haven't heated anybody up. I mean, in theory, you. I mean, you don't want to go back to Charlotte. I agree with that. But it's like you, you could you could have went to Oscar because I mean, Oscar lost to Charlotte, but she beat Becky at the Rumble. So you could go to that. But again, they did nothing to heat her up in any way. She didn't win the Battle Royal at Mania. You know, I mean, shit. I mean, even Carmella would work too. But yeah, I mean, Lacey's fine. I, I don't think. I know a lot of people are going to be worried right away that Becky's going to lose, but I, I kind of see Lacey as challenger of the month material right now. You know, something to give Becky something to do. Then hopefully we have someone else heated up by that. And uh, speaking of the women's division, Alexa Bliss, after what seems like a fucking eternity, returned to the ring on Raw. Yeah, it was good to see alexa back i i like alexa she's she does really good character work um they obviously trust her with big speaking roles i mean they let her host wrestlemania she one of the rare females who got her own talk show she might have was she the first female who ever got her own talk show um so so they clearly trust her in that role her ring work is hit and miss but it she is or at least can be a star in the division you know she's got the title history on her side she won't allow herself to get buried 
too far because the crowd always reacts to her and she is such a good promo that it's tough to just fully push her down the card like like someone like unfortunately bailey bailey great wrestler but she loses all these matches and then she can't really talk herself back into anything whereas alexa can kind of keep heat on herself uh, with her promo skills so it's good to see alexa back i guess she has legitimate beef with sasha banks and who knows what's going on with sasha banks right now um but I'm always happy to see Alexa Bliss. You can never go wrong with more Alexa Bliss. Yeah, I'm I'm just happy that she finally got cleared because, I mean, there was, you know, a lot of rumors at the time that there was concussion issues and other things that she might not come back in ring at all. And that's a very scary situation when you're that young. And, you know, that's the last thing we need is more people not being able to continue on and, things like that. So yeah, I was, I was happy to see her back. And I think the, the only good thing about her time away is that while she was on TV and she had speaking roles and stuff, she feels fresh again as a wrestler at least because we haven't seen her in a while. So that's good. And to your point too, I do agree that unlike a lot of women on the roster, I mean, she does have that talking ability. And like you said, someone like Bailey, who Bailey can have really good to great matches we've seen over the years, but she's not the best on the mic. So like you said, she can't talk herself out of something. You can't give her the mic and let her talk and rebound as you can someone like Alexa or Becky Lynch. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what they do with her exactly, how much she works. And, um, who she works with because the last thing they want to do is lose her again. And, um, but yeah, good to see her back. It's always a, a nice positive. Uh, speaking of returns too, we had Sami Zayn returned on raw. Um, Sami Zayn returned had a fun baby face match with Finn Balor. Everybody was happy to see Sammy back. Sammy lost. And then Sammy turned heel. And he basically shit all over the crowd for making WWE a toxic environment and uh, that people just want to be critics so that they can feel important. I swear to God, this was totally a Vince McMahon promo. This is one of those ones <laughs> it where was, you can, you can it hear was, Vince. <laughs> yeah, it was Vince's public response to John Oliver is what this promo was. Um I, I liked I, I liked this promo. I thought it was really good. I I don't mind heel Sammy. I know his whole gimmick throughout his whole career has been you know the the underground underdog and like he's been great in that role. But we saw his heel persona with Kevin Owens before the injury, and he was really good in that role as well. So I'm actually fine with them keeping him as a heel and letting him do this role. And now Kevin Owens is the baby face. And not that I need to see more matches from them. At least it's been a while since they've done these matches, but it's a different dynamic now than we're, we're used to seeing, assuming they, they do that feud or pair them up again, which I feel like they will because it's the only thing they know how to do with either guy. Uh, so I, I like this heel, Sammy. I think it's good. It's, it's something different and there's nothing wrong with doing something different with a with a guy like Sami Zayn. Yeah, I like heel Sami too. I have no problem with it. He's really good at it. I just I don't know if I would have done it the first night back. Like he lost the Balor. I might have waited another week or two, another loss. But again, they are doing the shake up next week, so maybe they wanted to get that established beforehand, which I understand. And uh, I was hoping he'd be back for. For Mania, because I was speculating the uh, him and Kevin Owens feud to continue with the, um, as you said, the roles reversed, because uh, that would be new for them in that, because it's always been asshole Kevin Owens versus lovable babyface Sammy or El Generico, depending on where, where they faced. So it will be interesting to see if they do get like a feud and if they do get to wrestle again, how that's going to change things. Because I've always really loved their work together. But it'll be really cool to see the roles reversed for once. Yeah, and Owens is 
I mean, he's he's Stone Cold Steve Austin now, I guess, with the way he's throwing out stunners. Um, Owens is definitely in a, a, a different role than we've kind of seen from him. And it, it's it's an interesting dynamic now with Sammy being the guy who's railing against WWE and Kevin Owens just kind of, I don't know if he's a company man, but he he's I guess he's kind of a loner. If anything, right now, I, I don't know if they've like completely defined this new Kevin Owens character because Vince McMahon throws him in the fast lane match. And so you're like, OK, is he a baby face or is he heel? And then he baby faces the whole thing against Daniel Bryan. Um, and then he just hasn't been on the show that often since that fast lane match. So I still think they they have to define his character a little bit more. But it's clear they're using some type of Steve Austin influence, at least based on the finisher and him just coming in and giving stunners to people. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll be interested to see if they end up on the same show. I I think it's kind of an inevitable because, like you said, they don't seem to know what to do with them uh, other than putting them together or putting them against each other. So we'll see what happens with that next week with the big shakeup. And to close out our Raw talk, um, Elias was uh, going to finally do his his big uh, rock opera and his concert that he got interrupted at WrestleMania. And he talked a bunch of shit about nobody interrupting him and they would have hell to pay. He mocked John Cena's rapping, showed us how it was done because it's simple. And then he was fucked because the dong hit. And The Undertaker, who was not at WrestleMania, made his return on Raw. My question is always, why don't people fucking run away while he's taking 15 minutes to get to the ring? Well, Elias had his chance to to leave, and then he decided, eh, I'm going to stick around and I'm going to you know, try to fight this man. And then he got laid out for it. Uh, I mean, no... I guess nobody should be scared of a 60 year old undertaker who can barely move. He looks in great shape. I give him credit for that. Um, but I, I don't know if anybody should be running away from him at this point. Granted, he's still kicking everybody's ass, but in, but if you're a professional wrestler and you're somebody like Elias, you could probably think this guy's 60 years old. And the last time we saw him he could barely move in that match uh, at crown jewel. So why wouldn't I take my shots at him? And the Undertaker surprised everybody. I love this segment. I love Elias. I like that he did a rapping gimmick here. I love that he's getting... I mean, he he talked about it on all the interviews he did prior to Mania. He's like, I need John Cena. I need The Undertaker. Because like these are characters who I can like battle with instead of wrestlers. Elias calls himself a character instead of a wrestler. And he's getting these feuds that... I are great for him. Elias is not a wrestler. We we've barely seen him in the ring. He's had some fine matches, but you don't really know what you're getting out of him in the ring. As a character, though, he's one of the most over guys on the roster. And there aren't that many guys who can like hold their own against him. Um, if he's just given kind of free reign and let him do whatever he, he wants to do on the guitar and with his singing and everything. There just aren't that many guys who can get up to that level. And, you know, you bring in Cena, you bring in The Undertaker, those guys are already at that level and above. So it's good for Elias. I hope he, I guess the report is he's going to face Undertaker at the next Saudi show. I hope he at least wins. Like, give the guy this victory because he's one of your future guys and The Undertaker should have retired five years ago I, I figure the undertaker will end up winning and and that's the unfortunate part about elias feuding with these legends is i don't have any faith that you know you're supposed to do business on your way out and I'm not saying the undertaker is done this year but he's not around so put the guy I who think is under, around the problem is, is taker's gonna stick around as long as the sweet saudi money shows are around because they love him and He's getting paid like over a million dollars or more to do all these fucking shows. One fucking sh two shows a year, man. He makes a couple million dollars, doesn't have to do shit else. I mean, that's the Saudi shows make more money for the company than Mania does. 
yeah, I don't blame Undertaker for taking all of this money. Honestly, like it's it's good money if you can get it, and he can still get it. Uh, I just look at it from a, a WWE perspective of he's going to be there regardless. You're not hurting the Undertaker if he loses these matches. People are still going to go crazy for this guy. Put the guy over who is there every single week and who can use that extra heat like if elias just keeps losing it's the same thing like when they would bring back the rock and he just buried rusev and then you know what did rusev gain out of that what what did these guys gain out of these legends coming back and just getting buried or burying all the guys who were there every single week like it it's a cool pop for the crowd sure like they're happy that the the legend won but you've got a television show to produce for 52 weeks a year. Like you gotta, you, you've got to put over the guys that are there for 52 weeks a year. Oh, I totally agree. The, the rock and Rusev one always bothered me too, because everybody goes, Whoa, you don't understand. Rusev just got the rub by doing a segment with the rock. And I'm like, he looked like a fucking geek. And like you said, they got nothing out of it. Lana got nothing out of it other than the rock hitting on her. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's, I, I agree. It's it's a shame because, like, I don't think Elias is going to be, like, an all-time great legend, but the dude is extremely good at what he does. And it's going to start meaning less and less and less if he never wins. He just, he looks like a geek. So hopefully they'll, I don't know, he's hes really good in the fact that he can stay over. But like you said, it's going to be diminishing returns if he just keeps losing. Yeah, don't, don't have this guy lose these matches. Have him finally win a match against these guys because Undertaker and Cena aren't going to be there. It's fine if he gets laid out in these segments. Like That's 100% fine. Just have him win the match. Yeah, that would be nice. So on SmackDown, uh, the Iconics had a match against a jobber team, and then Paige teased that she was going to bring in a impressive tag team to challenge them next week. So any guesses on who she may bring in next week? Um, Tamina and Nia Jax. <laughs> Uh, I I don't know. I know like Naya and Paige are like, legit good friends, so that's why I, I throw that out there. I I don't know. I like people have said Kyrie and uh, Io, and I I don't quite see that. I don't know. Like they don't need Paige. I don't see how they fit with Paige. Um, I'm glad Paige is doing something as a manager i think it's i think it's great you know she's been really like she was really good in the general manager role really really good the the most competent general manager they've had in years and then they decided because baron corbin sucked we're gonna take all the power from all the general managers and they said she'll still be around and then she hasn't been around so i'm glad they found something for her to do i i don't know who, who this team is going to be they don't need to call anybody else up um but yeah i, I don't know who fits with Paige. like did is it just mandy and sonia did they just reunite absolution it page as a manager i'm glad she's doing it i don't quite know the kind of like team you can stick with her as a manager because she has like she can play different roles, but right now she's playing the fighting with my family babyface role. So, like, what's a team that fits with that role? And I don't know if there's one out there unless you're just trying to throw two random women together who I don't know if they're gonna fit or not. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of interested. Um, in theory, I think you know they could maybe bring someone from like the UK roster over, like Rhea Ripley and someone else. You know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm kind of stumped on it, too. It's interesting. I, the, the running joke seems to be that she's just going to bring Nia and Tamina over. And I'm like, Christ, I hope not. Because that's the last thing I need to see is more matches with those two. I just, I'm like, no, no thank you. Yeah, we don't need to see Nia and Tamina at all. But if you're going to make Paige a heel, 
that you could basically put her in the Paul Ellering um, AOP role in, in that case. And I don't know. I, I don't have like super high hopes for this, um, but we'll see. Yeah. Again, Superstar Shakeup is next week. And ahead of the Superstar Shakeup, we had a title change on SmackDown as the Hardys beat the Usos to become the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. Yeah, cool. Um, the the Hardys, they're fine. It's 2019. It, the, I don't have any strong feelings either way on this, to be honest with you. Um, I like the Hardys. I've always been a big Hardys fan. They, Matt's gotten in great shape. They're they've dropped the whole you know broken universe gimmick and they're just the hardies again and it's fine it it is what it is um i really like the usos title run and the usos are still one of the more underappreciated tag teams in wwe history i just yeah, I don't have strong feelings about this either way honestly i the, the tag team divisions feel like such a mess right now and hopefully the superstar shakeup gives us some fresh matches and whatnot um i mean the whole roster feels like a mess everybody's just appearing on every show right now so it's tough to really say like oh th they can do this match and this match and that match because who knows where either of these guys are gonna or any of these guys are gonna end up next week yeah i i, I don't have a big problem with it i think it's fine for a short-term thing um you know the heart i mean you can love them or hate them but the hardies are still over um, it's not like they're having bad matches or anything. And, um, you know, the Usos match was good and fun. And it'll be interesting to see if they stay on the same show or, you know, if the tag champions maybe switch shows and we'll see what happens, like you said. But, yeah, a lot of that we'll have to answer after next week. But, uh, yeah, short term, I have no problem with it. They're still over. If 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 people stop giving a shit about them, then we can – you know, if they get booted out of the building next week and people don't care, we can talk about that then. But right now, I don't see a big problem with it. No, it's, again, it's it's fine. The Hardys are fine. Yeah, I don't I, I know a lot of people seem to, saw a lot of people upset about it, and I don't see a, a big reason to get upset so much over it. But, you know, that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, moving on, we are going to go back to WrestleMania week events. And we're going to talk about the Impact Wrestling United We Stand uh, pay-per-view. This was a show that uh, I know you, both you and I were actually looking forward to. We were pretty excited about it. Um, and unfortunately, um, there were some changes to the card. There was no Yamato because of the visa issues. He was replaced by Flamita. And then in the opening match, uh, Koto Brazil didn't make the show. And then they didn't give any reason, but just said Jack Evans was off the show. And it was like, oh, oh, okay, maybe reasons perhaps, but uh, no, no reasons. But ult We started off with Ultimate X, which was J. Chris, Dante Fox, Pat Buck, Johnny Impact, and Ace Austin. Your thoughts, Jeremy? Um, Ace Austin is lucky to be alive after that flip he took off of the ultimate x structure there uh that looked like absolute hell um they did a good enough job catching him to where he didn't completely die but jesus that was a hell of a bump to take it, it was fine it, johnny impact winning is it, it felt like they could have done something different because you're not pinning your world champion but they're clearly building the company around this guy, so it, it is what it is. Now he's going to get an X Division title shot at some point, maybe if they remember this show happened, and I, then you're kind of stuck in you're doing disqualification or Rich Swan or Sammy Callahan, whoever ends up being the champion. Uh, he's your he's beating your world champion to retain the the X Division title, which I don't see really happening or. Johnny Impact is uh, Johnny Two Belts. So, I, I don't know. I, I didn't really care for Johnny Impact winning this match. As far as the match, it was a good Ultimate X match. Not 
great, not anything super memorable outside of the Ace Austin bump. Um, it almost seemed to set the tone for the show in a bad way because this should have been like a the big kickoff of this is going to be a great show. And it was just like, all right, that was fine. And then it just kind of, you know, st- stayed steady from there. Yeah, the other thing about this was uh, the show got off to a bad start technical wise because first of all, the hard camera was focused on like only half the ring and apparently there was nobody there with it. It just stayed like on this one, like the left side of the ring. Oh my God. We'll, we'll talk about this throughout the show, but the production issues on this show were horrendous. Yeah. And then the other thing was for about 90% of the opening match, there was only sound out of the left side speaker. And it wasn't just me. Because the the fight TV chat room was bitching up a storm, and then of course you had the company defenders going, "I'm sure it's not Impact's fault." And then it's like, "Well, then why were there like 800 other shows with like no technical issues on the same format that day?" Like nobody was bitching about fight TV all day until that show. So yeah, that was not good. They have production, lighting, sound, camera shots. Just not good. Uh, like I said, it was it was a good opener. It was a good Ultimate X, but outside of Ace Austin, almost dying. Nothing really you would remember. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, it it set the tone for what turned out to be sort of a disappointing show. Next up, we had the Impact versus Lucha Underground's trying not to be dead match, <laughs> which was uh, Cage Moose and Eddie Edwards versus. Drago, Daga, Marty, Marty the Moth, and Aerostar. And since Impact was down one man with Johnny Impact refusing to team with his team, everybody was like, oh, maybe it's going to be Eli Drake. But he was about to be released, so that didn't happen. And they trotted out Tommy fucking Dreamer. And you know what? What a fucking worker, man. This dude keeps getting booked 2017, 18, 19 on TV for ROH and Impact and on pay-per-views. I mean, God bless Tommy Dreamer, but I mean, hell of a worker in that regard, but I don't need Tommy Dreamer on my pay-per-views. I'm okay. And then, then you, have like, you have like Josh Matthews and Don Callis like, Tommy looks better than ever. It's like, really? So we're going with that now? I I tweeted like nobody, you know, nobody says anything and impact is like Tommy Dreamer. I I don't yeah, as you said, God bless this guy for getting all of this work constantly. We don't need Tommy Dreamer in 2019. We didn't need him in 2000. Uh I guess maybe he was still coming off his ECW run then Uh, but we certainly didn't need him past let's say 2005 and we're in 2019 now and this guy is still getting steady work for I don't think they're the number two company anymore but still a viable wrestling company in America Uh, this killed the match immediately for me Uh, we we both thought it was going to be Eli Drake, and then we found out, well, he ended up getting released a couple days later, so that explains that. Um, they, I would have rather just been four on three. It, we didn't need Tommy Dreamer in this match, and it, it wasn't even a great match. It was just, it was there, and I like, I was taken out of it immediately when Tommy Dreamer came out. I was like, ah, fuck this. I'm not paying attention to this nonsense. Yeah, it was a okay solid match but it it felt sloppy and off and it just i don't know i never really got into it i kept waiting for like like cool shit to happen or just something to make me care and the big thing in the match was that moose turned on his team and you know he didn't want to tag in with some turned on his team and then team lucha underground who's probably dead won (laughs) <laughs> what are your thoughts on on Brian Cage? Because I loved him in Lucha Underground, and then the more I see of him, 
you realize how good of a job Lucha Underground did to like hide his weaknesses. Uh, I think Cage is a he's a very hit and miss performer. I think he has. There's times where he looks great, and uh, like I've seen like PW Mat G matches where he's just great, and like you said Lucha Underground, there were times where he looked great, and then there's times where he's just he's a he's a jacked up dude trying to do flippy shit, and it doesn't come off that well. You know, it's it's really weird with him. But um yeah, I think um yeah, not gonna lie, I think Lucha Underground helped him with the fact that they did a lot of post production work and editing and uh the way they booked him and the matches they put him in was very protective and uh Impact just doesn't do that because there's Christ, there's matches I watch on that show sometimes and it's like you know, there are good matches on Impact. Please don't let me don't let me come off as saying there aren't good matches, but there are times where something makes TV and I'm just like, You taped this four weeks ago. How the fuck is that on your TV? Yeah, you know, just like a giant botch or miscommunication spot, just something that kind of ruins a match and it's like, how do you let that happen? You know, you gotta it's not that like it just makes your show look bad, but you need to perfect protect your performers who you're trying to portray as stars. You know, don't fucking throw them under the bus like that. If it's live, it's live. Shit happens. But when you have the ability to protect somebody in post-production and you don't take it, that just feels lazy. Yeah, Brian Cage, to me, I haven't been... Again, I really liked him in Lucha Underground. And from some of the indie stuff I've seen, like it, that's been fine too. Impact, like his impact run has just been a lot of sizzle and, and no real substance to me. I, I see Brian Cage and I'm just like, eh. I had high hopes for this guy. And a lot of it, some of it is probably impact and how they book guys and how they shoot guys and everything. Uh, I just, I haven't been impressed with, with this impact run from him. Yeah, it's like a lot of he's had a lot of good matches, but like, yeah, I, I haven't seen that like upper tier stuff from him. So yeah, I think I think that's a very fair point. Next up, knockouts title match, which was champion Ty Valkyrie versus Rosemary versus uh, Jordan Grace versus Katie Forbes, who should quite honestly never be invited back. <laughs> um. I I wish they like this is when again the I, the ultimate X match sort of set the tone of this is a throwaway show like Johnny Impact is going to win and that tells you all you need to know and then Tommy Dreamer comes out and then in this match it's well Taya just wins and that that's fine I'm not saying Taya should lose the title here it, it again it felt like you can do something special on these shows and Taya just winning was just a it's it's the norm this is what we're sticking with this show is actually instead of some like great special that we've put together with all these cool matches that you won't see anywhere else and this chance to do something really cool this is just a glorified house show and and this was another example of it like the match wasn't good Taya winning was just the norm, and then that was that. Yeah, um, I, the match was just, it was not good. It was it was slow, it was sloppy, it was dis- disjointed. Crowd was not into it. Katie Forbes did not look like she belonged in there in any way. The worst part was, she decides that in a match with Jordan fucking Grace, that she's going to try to do power spots. And, like, there was one point she tried to do something with Rosemary and about dropped her. And then she tried to do a spot where she tried to pick up Rosemary and Taya, like, in a fireman's carry. And that just fucking went to hell, and she almost dropped them on their heads. And, like, she was falling down during it. She looked horrible. I I don't know if this is true. I heard somebody say that this is the chick RBD's with now. Uh, uh, I can look that up. Yeah, look that up. But if that's the case, that's probably the only reason she got on the show. 
But uh, yeah, she was um, she was no good. I thought that honestly, like Ty was okay, Rosemary was okay. The only one that really looked good in the match, I thought, was Jordan Grace, and it just um, it was unfortunately a bad match. And it does is- it does say Rob Van Dam is dating a professional wrestler. It says Kate Forbes. I assume it's the same person. All right. Well, there you go. Yeah. So that's how she got booked. Well, good on RVD. Yeah, I hope that doesn't mean she's coming in. Um, since he's signed now, God, that's the last thing we need. I'm all for adding more women to the roster, but you know, maybe good ones. Well, they just added Madison Rain. That's as good as you're getting. I guess so for now. <laughs> Moving on, LAX versus Loki and Ricky Martinez from MLW. And uh, hey, the good news is Loki showed up for his booking. Loki did show up. Um, the bad news was he and Ricky Martinez did not have a good of match with LAX as the Rock and Roll Express did. No, not at all. Um, I, I don't know if Loki and Ricky Martinez were just kind of out of it. They, I know Loki worked the MLW show, um, and I don't recall if Ricky Martinez did, but they they clearly didn't have the whether it was the energy or just the the effort uh, to to put into this match. They were going through the motions and. You know, LAX did what they could. LAX looked fresh and ready to work, but it, it's tough to work a tag team match when only one side is trying. And yeah, the Rock and Roll Express were obviously much more into things a couple nights later at Janela's spring break. And LAX looked much more into things with, with them as well. But a low key showed up. At least there's that. Yeah, like it was a fine match. It's just like you said, a. Uh... It didn't feel like the MLW crew was into it. It was pretty lethargic here at times. And just like I was expecting a little more. Like I wasn't expecting necessarily a great match, but I was expecting like a good match. And it just like it was a little below good. And it was like it was fine. LAX won. Okay. So yeah, there's a, you know, there's, I don't know. Like, I don't know if Key was tired, but yeah, him and, I think it was just collecting a check. But at least he showed up. Hey, I mean, if you can collect a check, collect a check. That's right. It's more than he did last year when he bailed on uh, <laughs> yeah, that real blood, blood sport. sport. Yeah, exactly. He his neck injury because he didn't want to die at the hands of an Oro Suzuki. <laughs> <laughs> so we move on to Tessa Blanchard versus Joey Ryan. And this match was everything you said you didn't want from it. Yeah, I wanted um, Tessa to come in there and kill Joey Ryan because that's how she's been booked on Impact. That's how she should be booked. And it was it was a Joey Ryan match, unfortunately. And again, I don't say this as a knock to Joey Ryan. I watched uh, Penis Party. I, I watched the, jo- the Janela Spring Break shows. Joey Ryan has his place and like the, the penis party six man tag or six person tag was good for exactly what you want it to be in that spot. This was a match that I didn't want to be in this spot and it shouldn't have been, it, it really shouldn't have been. It should have been Tessa Blanchard and even Joey Ryan just sort of dropping that whole stuff. Joey Ryan just kind of going out there and having more, of a straight wrestling match and, and kind of showing like, Hey, I can do this as well. I'm not just this dick guy and Tessa Blanchard being Tessa Blanchard. Instead, it was, it was a Joey Ryan match where he had to get his, uh, dick flips and blow pops in. And it's just like, uh, what? It's not the place for this. It's, it's not the show for this. You've got all weekend to do this stuff. You, this is not the the time and the place to do it. At least Tessa won, I guess. Yeah, I uh, was not a fan of this at all. I thought it was bad. Just uh, too much Joey Ryan bullshit. And the thing was to me, and I agreed with everything you were saying, It's and we talked about it when we previewed the show, is to me it felt really like an embarrassing display from Impact 
to put Tessa in this match and allow it to go forward how it did, considering she's one of the biggest pushed acts in the whole company. It just it felt like so minor league. This is where I go back and I say this was just a glorified house show where I don't know how much any of it meant. And that that's not to defend impact because again, going into it, we thought it should have meant more. Like they hyped it as being this big show. We we were both excited for it. They put together some really good matches. It should have been something that they would, you know, use on their TV to push. And I I can't imagine outside of, I guess, Johnny Impact, because now he's the number one contender for the X Division title. I can't imagine, like, when... And even then, they might just do it on one of these one-off shows on Twitch that they do um, every month, it seems. But I, I just can't imagine that they're actually going to make too much mention of this show on their television, because... It wasn't booked like it was part of their television show. It was booked like it was just a, a glorified house show. And if that's the case, then sure, the Joey Ryan stuff made more sense then because that's what people would want out of a Joey Ryan match at, at a house show. They they wouldn't want more of a straight wrestling match. They want Joey Ryan to get all of his spots in. Uh, but that that is still a knock on impact in that you had a chance to do something different with this show and you basically did what every other company this week was doing and you you blended in with the rest of these independent shows instead of really standing out and really delivering a show where people are like hey did you see that impact show on wrestlemania week you know they've got television every week they this was a really good representation of their television. This is something they can build off of on their television. And now it's just like this show didn't mean anything. Yeah. And I think what's even, I don't know, maybe it's good for them, but it, to me, it feels even worse is that, you know, last year they did the Twitch show with Lucha Underground. That, that's cool. But this, this was like the first time that they actually like, we're going to do a fucking WrestleMania weekend show. And they had some guests in, and that's there's nothing wrong with that. But it felt like, you know, there was just no buzz going into it. And there was, like, nobody talking about it when it was on. Like, on Twitter and stuff. It was, it was, it was definitely in a bad spot, because it was, what, like 11.30 on a, it on was a 11, Thursday? 11 o'clock at night, yeah, but I, I'll tell you what. The fucking Janela show that was on after midnight... You know, I, I was on Twitter and checking stuff out, and there was people talking about that way more than the Impact Show. Oh, for, for sure. Janela, I mean, two things there. One, Janela's show was Saturday night, and it followed G1 Supercard, so everyone was already, like, watching wrestling and really excited for wrestling. And then you've got Janela's show, and then, you know, it's the weekend as well. People can kind of afford to stay up a little bit more. And two, Janela has... It's only been a couple of years, three years, but he's built that show already where, you know, Impact is just doing a show at a random time slot that they even changed to accommodate the MLW show. Yeah, it just it felt like really sad, though, that like just nobody talking about the damn show, you know, it's a, and I, I'm kind of used to that, though. It's like every week when Impact's on, it's like it doesn't feel like anybody's talking about it. You know, there's there's the accounts that we all follow that do all that gif all the major shows and stuff. And like, there's like nobody gif an impact. Nobody's really talking about it. I don't know. It, it just it, it kind of falls it, into the disappointment of the show for me. Uh, again, it was it just it felt like a glorified house show. And now I, I feel bad that we even gave it the time of day to preview because it it definitely just looks like a. Uh, if if we didn't preview it, then I think we both still would have been. They they had a chance to do something different with this show. They could have created a buzz with this show, and they they completely dropped the ball on it, which is which is impact, I guess. Yeah, and again, I know people are going to be like, "Oh, you guys are just dogging on this show." It's like, again, pay attention. We were really excited for this show. <laughs> we were like. 
this looks good. It, it might be one of the underrated shows of the weekend. And it just ended up a show that wasn't very good. But we'll move on. Rich Swan defending the X Division title against Flamita, who again was replacing Yamato due to the Dragon Gate Visa snafu. Your thoughts? It was a fine little sprint. I think it went like less than 10 minutes or something. So it's not like they had. Yeah, it's not like they had a whole lot of time for this match, but they they worked a quick style. It's it's tough to have a bad like Rich Swan match in that short amount of time because he's gonna get all his athletic spots in, and and Flamito could keep up with him. So it, it was fine. It was the the winner was never in doubt, so there was never too much drama created there. Uh, but it was probably my my favorite match on the show, honestly. Yeah, it was it was a good little match. I just I I wished it would have got a little more time. I think it would have been better, but you know, at least it was good. I look I, I looked at it that way at the end. I'm like, it could have been better, but at least it was good. You know, I nothing to really complain about other than it would have been nice for them to get a little bit more time. So yeah, and uh move on to the semi main event. Monsters Ball, Sammy Callahan versus Jimmy Havoc. We got Staples Guns. We got trash cans, we got Legos, we got trash cans and paper cuts and apron pile drivers and fucking lemons and salt and wounds. <laughs> and, uh, it was basically these two dudes just trying to kill each other as usual. It's, it's what they do. Um, I thought this was good as well, but um, I thought that the UK match they had last year, last year was way more energetic and it felt more violent and it had a better crowd. Um, so, but again, not bad in any way, just kind of good. Yeah, I, I agree with that in that like they did violent stuff, but it didn't feel violent. And I don't know if that makes any sense, but that that's sort of just the feeling that I got. It felt like they were just doing violent stuff for the sake of doing violent stuff instead of doing this stuff to like really hurt the opponent and, and like put them away and try to kill them and everything. And she's like, eh, we know what the fans expect. This is what we have to deliver out here. And that's what they did. Um, we talked about it on the preview show that I think both guys worked the, the MLW show, uh, um, Havoc definitely did. He, he had that match against um, Tom Waller, and I, I'm fairly certain Callahan showed up on that show as well. And so like these guys, especially especially Havoc, after having a, a violent match against Tom Waller, it, it the it's late. You're burnt out already from working previous shows, and then you watch a, a show like um, some of the GCW stuff over the weekend, um, like the the part one Janela spring break, um, the, the Jimmy Lloyd match, like that match was like a violent, violent match that felt violent for all the right reasons of I'm trying to kill you and beat you. This one just felt, let's just do a bunch of stuff that the fans are going to like and think is cool, but it's just a bunch of stuff. Yeah. I think the other thing is too, is like you said, that it's kind of did violent shit for violent shit, but I think the other thing was like the UK match they did also got more time. And the other thing was that they did a lot of really good teases in that match and they really built up to the violent spots in that match as well. So it made everything feel like it had a little more impact to it. And uh, like you said, the, the, um, I know, I know the match you're talking about the um, Jimmy Lloyd match. Yeah. It's like that match just ended up like fucking almost, Almost too much for a lot of people I read. And uh, just a lot of blood. And yeah, it looked like people were going to die. So, <laughs> and um, this match, I mean, I don't need buckets of blood. And I don't need overly sick shit happening. Um, I think just maybe the drama building to it would have really helped to it. But it, it was good. It seemed like fans liked it okay. And, um, you know, they they did their match. So... One thing I didn't, and, and now I'm going to talk about the production issues, is the audio sucked all night. You yes. couldn't hear 
backstage promos. Uh, you couldn't hear even in ring promos. One thing that was without a doubt loud as shit was the the music and Sammy Callahan's entrance music. It's just him screaming. And oh my God, my eardrums busted when that happened because I didn't even have the sound on that loud, but you had to turn it up a little bit just to, to hear anything on the show. And But the, the entrance music was like at 50 octaves higher. And oh, that that completely that it wasn't a fun experience at like 1:30 or whenever his music hit because it's just like oh my god get like get your shit together at this point and and i guess this was a, a thing all night is you know if you have these late shows you really got to have some type of an investment in them to really want to stay up and watch them for example like the the uh um the black craft show that was on friday night is all right it was wrestling on a friday night and like the the crowd wasn't even that bad but i was just like uh, i don't have any like great investment into this that's like really carrying me to to watch the show other than it's it's wrestling at two o'clock in the morning and, and then janella like the crowd is just into everything and i was excited for that show and like i was excited for this show as well but you wouldn't know that this was a an exciting show because like you couldn't hear the crowd apparently people on twitter were saying oh the crowd is hot for everything you would not know it if you just watched this show and honestly it it made it kind of just put me to sleep even more because the crowd just wasn't into anything and so i'm just like yeah this show isn't really that great and the crowd's not really like lifting my viewing experience to where i'm thinking i should stay up and, and watch these matches so like the the audio was just god awful on the show yeah and again that that goes back to what i was talking about with your production you need to you need to protect your performers and I, I read all that too. Like the voices of wrestling guys were there and they were talking about, Oh wow. The, they have a full house crowds really hot here. And I, 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 I you know, I sent them a message or I sent, replied to them on Twitter. I was like, you wouldn't know it from the fight TV presentation because whoever was in charge, I don't know who it is. So I can't directly throw anybody under the bus. But the fact is whoever was in charge of audio and whoever liked the crowd, was horrible at it because that crowd sounded dead all night. As you said, the entrance music way too loud, commentary way too loud. Just yeah, it wasn't good. It was very upsetting because you know what? It's like if a show is not that great in the ring, but everybody's invested in it and you have a hot crowd, it does help. It makes the show feel like it has an energy to it. But when you have a show like this that just felt kind of average at best, and then you have like technical problems, and then you can't hear the damn crowd, and again, a disservice to the performers. But when you can't hear that crowd, and it's apparently a hot crowd, it's just horrible. So I, I was very upsetting. Yeah, the, yeah. the production issues killed the show for me even more combined with just the the wrestling not being all that good so the main event was the lucha bros versus rvd and sabu now i know we all didn't expect much out of rvd and sabu from this i will say that it was an okay match they did eight minutes um which was probably for the best um, it was RVD and Sabu trying to play the hits in slow motion. But I will say, listen, I, I know it's the job of the commentator to put people over. And I know RVD had signed with the company. But I have to say, Don Callis was a complete embarrassment here. He kept trying to put RVD and Sabu over as being as good as they ever were and Josh, is this 1995? Look at RVD. No, Don. It's 2019, and RVD almost kicked his partner in the face on the rolling fucking thunder. <laughs> it's like, you have to have a little bit of legitimacy 
you know, put them over as the legends coming back to face the new hottest team in wrestling. Don't tell me that it's like 1995 again. Don't tell me they're as good as they ever were. Because they're not. It's just a fact. They're older, slower, and beaten down. Don't try to sell me a bunch of bullshit. So, your thoughts? I I was looking forward to this match. As I said in the preview, I'm a big RVD mark. I wasn't expecting much. Like, when it ended... I was surprised because I knew it didn't last long. Um, and, and But then when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, that, that was probably a good time to end it. Like, I didn't want to actually see more, even though I knew it was a, a fairly short match and maybe they could have done more. RVD is older. Sabu is much older. Um, and I, and I say much older in that he's wrestled a tougher style than RVD throughout the years and just didn't take care of his his body the way RVD did. The the Lucha Brothers are very good. They they'd wrestled a bunch of matches throughout the day as well. I think like they were at the MLW show, they were at the uh, the the WrestleCon Super Show. So this was at least their third match on the night, and it's two a.m. Uh, where whenever this show or whenever this match gets started they're in there against you know two old guys so there's only so much you you can kind of do in that in that aspect it 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 was it was fine it was i guess below my expectations because i i just thought there would be a little bit more of better showing for for rvd and it just wasn't he he just kind of showed his age and yeah on callus I'm fine. Like you got to put the guys over, and you know it means more if Pentagon and Phoenix beat these guys. If you're putting them over as legends and still being good and everything, but there there's a line between you know saying they're legends, saying they're still being good, and then just going over the top and killing your credibility and and just being like, oh, they're better now than they ever were, and blah 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 and you know they can do this and they can do that when like we're watching the match and we can see that they're just not moving that well and their timing is not very good and it's just not you know it's not a good performance like it's okay to say you know they're they're legends they got a little bit of ring rust like you can cover for them like they they truthfully do have ring rust i don't know the last time they've actually teamed up together i rvd only works a handful of matches a year and sabu i don't think keeps like a super active schedule so they probably do have ring rust and they're in there against legitimately one of the best teams in the world right now so it's it's okay if they're struggling a little bit it doesn't take away from their legendary status yeah exactly and the thing is is i always feel with the commentary team you have to you have to keep it to a point to where you have some legitimacy to the things you're saying because it's like that's why Jim Ross worked. Jim Ross, you believe Jim Ross, and you could get behind Jim Ross. And when Jim Ross was selling you a fucking moment because he had built up all this trust with you, you were into it. And then when they like did that heel Michael Cole shit, it just never came off well because it felt felt like you could. It, first of all, it was bad. But second of all, it just felt like you could never trust Michael Cole. And then there was no emotion, there was no investment. So yeah, but that was a uh, impact. And then Callis and then, slammed yeah. down his headset as the show ended in another just break your eardrum moment. Yeah. Oh god, yeah. So that was Impact United We Stand. Uh, again, a show Jeremy and I both had a a lot of high hopes heading into, but uh ultimate ultimately just uh did not deliver so next up we're going to talk about the roh new japan pro wrestling g1 supercard live from madison square garden the first non-wwe show in decades to take place from the hallowed halls of msg and uh i think the best way to put the show overall was it was kind of a tale of two shows. Uh, and it kind of felt like, um, you know when you're moving and you recruit some friends to help you? 
and you get that one friend that goes, I'll be there and I'll help you. And then they come over and then they do none of the heavy lifting and they don't do an equal amount of work. And they're just pretty much shit at their job. And you and the other people were doing all the heavy lifting and hard work. That was kind of the relationship between New Japan and ROH here. And ROH was the shitty friend. So I mean, th- we were- this is like always been the relationship between these two companies. Kevin Kelly said it on a podcast months ago in that like ROH kind of only uses New Japan to sell tickets Uh, let's be honest if this is just a an roh show at the garden it's not it's not selling out um i mean maybe you know i i I take that back for for one reason and one reason only is when this show was announced there was no inkling of all elite wrestling and so you would think that uh the elite guys would possibly be part of it um when tickets go on sale and they they had enough buzz to where yeah they could probably sell out madison square garden with the roh name and and with uh the elite name but if you if you take them out of it like if you said tickets are on sale in january after aew has been released and it's just an roh show and you're not getting omega and cody and the bucks like tickets are not selling out at all and i i don't i don't know what ticket sales would be i know they're not packing the house because roh just doesn't have much of a buzz and and this show once again just kind of showed it in that you know they needed new japan to be on this show and people came to see the the new japan guys they came to see okada and tanahashi and ibushi and naito like no one came to see matt taven yeah and the thing is too is like You know, if you would, it's like there was a couple middle ground matches, the title unification matches, but if you would split the show into just pure ROH and pure New Japan, the New Japan show is like, you know, an upper tier show of the year contender, while the Ring of Honor portion is like a a low, you know, an upper tier bad show of the year presentation. So we will get into this, and I agree about the ticket sale line. It's, yeah. The ROH roster as it stands is not selling 16,000 tickets. It's just not doing it. So we started off with the 30-man honor Rambo, which is your Royal Rumble-style match filled with everybody not on the main card for the most part. Um, It went 42 minutes. It was a long one. Um, Had a bunch of people in there. You had Kenny King. You started number one. And he demanded to start number one. Um, Minoru Suzuki was number two. And I was just waiting for him to kill him. And it didn't quite happen. But um, the one thing that was a common trend throughout this match was that the ROH guy would come out and he would get, like, no reaction. And then a New Japan guy would come out and they would get a big reaction. There was one exception. Yoshihashi really didn't get a reaction. But I will tell you this. Here's the fact, though. When Chase fucking Owens, who I love, but is not exactly a big star, when Chase fucking Owens walks out in MSG and gets a massive pop and the Ring of Honor guys don't, might be a problem. Yeah, the New Japan guys were over in this match, and the Ring of Honor guys... like this, This, again, just speaks to the quality of the ring of honor roster is you know new japan throws out chase owens and he gets a great reaction new japan they've got like uh ishii and and goto in this match and um you know obviously liger and like they can throw these guys who are legitimate stars in new japan and ring of honor is throwing out like the kingdom and I don't even know who else they had in this match. I guess Colt Cabana got a good reaction. Um, oh, okay, yes. Colt was the lone exception. Because the, the, the spot with Colt Cabana was Colt was doing commentary, if you haven't seen this. And number 27 in the match was Yano, who him and Colt, you know, total comedy acts and they, you know when they do their stuff together. Yano comes out and runs over to the announce table 
And they're like, Yano, you're in. He's like, no, no. And he tries to get Colt to go into the match. And Colt Cabana accepts his you know, number. And he goes into the match. And Yano, who doesn't speak much English, is on commentary. He's like, they're like, Yano, why don't you want to compete? He goes, I scared Colt very strong. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, fuck it, I'm not in this, man. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, that was fun. Colt actually got a huge reaction. Like, the only ROH guy to get a huge reaction. Um, King Haku was in the match. Shut up, shut up. Nice surprise. He, he threw the tongue and death grip on Colt, which caused Yano to run in to try to make the save. And uh, the number 30, like, you had Liger in there, which was awesome. But number 30, the big surprise of the night, was the great fucking Muta appeared. And Muta has been out of action for months. Uh, the years of doing moonsaults and everything took a toll on him. He had double knee replacement surgery. And uh, he was in town for the weekend. And, hey, you know what? Great on New Japan and Norwich for making it happen. Because, I mean, Muda is awesome. Um, I mean, yes, he's old now. He only did a couple trademark spots. But the fact is, you got Muda, you got the nostalgia pop, he got the work to guard, and I think that's awesome. Between between Haku, uh, Muda, and, and Liger, like that, those three really made this Rumble memorable. Um, everything else just blended together and didn't mean anything. But they got three, three I, I will say legends on on the card, and three guys who again they're they're just their memorable names that it's memorable appearances that these guys were there at the garden. I mean, Haku and Muda were surprises. Liger wasn't an actual surprise, but just seeing him in the garden was, was really cool to see. And yeah, it, it was a, it was a good moment for, for all these guys just to get in that match. And it, it made the match something because otherwise it was, it was really just a, a nothing thing. And then they, they ruined it all by having Kenny King winning. <laughs> Yeah, and that's the worst part. It comes down to the Kingdom, which is Vinny Marsegla and TK Ryan, versus Muda and Liger. And Muda and Liger eliminate them. So we get, we're get we getting the big fucking Muda-Liger showdown. And they work for about 30 seconds. And then Kenny King did the old heel hiding under the ring bullshit. Sneaks in, eliminates them both, and wins the match. And it's just like... Nobody wanted that. Nobody liked it. And it was like a theme throughout the match, too, to where I was talking about how, like, the ROH guys would come out and everybody but Colt got, like, no reaction. And then the New Japan guys would get reactions, minus Yoshi and And then when there was eliminations, like, oh, my God, the crowd was livid when, like, Suzuki and Ishii got tossed. They were like, what is this bullshit? But then it was even worse at the end here with the Kenny King win. Because they Dude, were this. excited. Because I think, I think like me, a lot of people saw that Liger was in this. And that, you know, they might do, like, get, give Liger the title. Um, shot at the title, excuse me. Because that's what the winner gets is a shot at the world title. And someone's like, well, you can't do that because Liger's a New Japan guy. When are they going to do it? And the answer is, May! They're doing four fucking shows together in May. It's not that hard if you pay attention. The and this was the disappointing thing of it as well is there were only so many winners I feel like you could go with because of the ROH title stipulation. And yeah, yeah, they're do, they're doing shows in May, but who knows what their their booking plans are right now with ROH? Really, who the hell knows what their booking plans are? I thought beforehand that like Juice Robinson would have made sense because he's obviously a kind of a, a tweener with with both companies, and so you can like he's a guy you can throw into the world title picture, give him a world title shot, and it actually feels like it's a a good viable match. Like you give this spot to Kenny King, and as we saw later in the night you're headlining a show at some point with Kenny King against Matt Taven. <laughs> I don't know what show you're headlining with that. Uh, I, I don't, I don't have high hopes that that show is going to be very good. 
or draw very good or do anything. It's just you're headlining a show with Kenny King against Matt Taven for your world title. Yeah, and I didn't have high hopes when they main evented a show with Jay Lethal and Kenny King. And I think Lethal's great. And it's just, yeah. All, all, all I can imagine is, I don't know. Dude, I just, yeah, I'm not not into it, dude. But the first big match of the night on the proper pay-per-view was ROH TV champion Jeffrey Cobb defeating never open weight champion Will Ospreay, which means Jeff Cobb now holds both championships as both were on the line. I thought as a proper pay-per-view opener, this was great. Um, these guys know how to work well together. They played the size difference well, played off their past interactions. And, uh, you know, Jeff Cobb came across like a superstar winning. Will Ospreay continues to deliver bangers. And, uh, yeah, great way to open the show. I love this match. Um, I, I said it beforehand. I think Osprey is like one of my top three favorite wrestlers to watch right now. I think he's just great at everything, can work so many different styles. And Jeff Cobb is amazing as well. As far as the, the winner goes, Jeff Cobb makes more sense because we know Cobb like wants to work more in New Japan. I don't think Osprey really cares to work in ROH, so him holding their TV title would be a little a little difficult there. While Cobb can, you know, a never open weight title just kind of bounces around from from guy to guy anyway. So Cobb winning certainly certainly made sense. The match was was just fantastic. It was a I wish it got a little bit more time, but they packed in a lot of action to to the time they did get. But I would still like to see just an extended match um, between these two because I love Will Ospreay and Jeff Cobb. Just he's a guy who can keep up with Will Ospreay and like he can be a really strong base for him while like almost kind of a Cesaro role where he can bounce around with Osprey, but also just be that base for Osprey to, to bounce around alongside him. So I love this match. Yeah, I agree. I'd love to see an ex- a little more of an extended match. Um, you know, we, I don't need 30 minutes, but uh, you a little close, closer to 20 would be great. Cause this was just under 13, but yeah, just a great way to kick off the pay-per-view. And, um, Next up was Roosh versus Dalton Castle. And I will give credit where credit is due. This was the one thing ROH fucking nailed on the night. If you didn't see it, the match, the bell rings. Rush hits the, Roosh hits the running drop kick. He hits the bull's horns twice. And he pins Dalton Castle in 19 seconds. I thought it was perfect. They've been playing up the story that Dalton Castle is not the same guy he was and that he shot and that he was trying to basically get a big rebound win over star and he fucking failed got his ass beat failed quote unquote distracted by his own boys it gives roosh a um a major win on a major stage on the biggest show of the year for them and then post match we got dalton castle beating down the boys and turning heel. Your thoughts? I thought this was great for what it was. As you said, it was the perfect spot for it because you look up and down this card and there are so many matches that were going to need time and so many matches that that had so much potential that if you know, you add more time to this. Who knows if that takes away time from something else? Or and we'll talk about some of the kind of the timing stuff a little bit later on. But this is exactly what it needed to be because, as you said, Castle is pretty shot right now with his back injury. You want Roosh to be a big star, and if you want a guy to be a big star, then you haven't beat a former world champion in ten seconds. And there you go. So this was one of the few things ROH got right on the night. And then Castle beating down the boys is, we'll see where it goes. We'll see if he's actually snapped and it is now a completely different character or if he was lost in the heat of the moment or if they kind of slow tease it a little bit more. But it's it's something different for Dalton Castle. He needed some type of edge to his character now because he just he hasn't been the same since, since the back injury and he, he can't go like he used to and so 
kind of the gimmick he was working beforehand just it didn't really work anymore because he's just not quite the same guy so doing something new with him is a is a good idea yeah i'm hoping um that with the heel turn that it it'll make for a stylistic change for him that that can help him work around whatever's bothering him still uh, which it looks to be the back um working a more deliberate brawl style you know, like Steve, you saw guys like Steve Austin. You know, Steve Austin was a technician that would take to the air a little bit here and there. And then obviously after the knee and neck issues turned into a total badass brawler. So it'll be interesting to see if uh, Castle can kind of transform himself in a little bit. And something that's just going to allow him to work, work better and not look like he's struggling through matches. So, yeah, the heel turn has a lot of potential. We'll see what happens. I'm just uh, I'm hoping for the best, and I'm hoping he gets better. Just not not I'm not even talking in terms of performing. I just I hope he gets healthy because I hate seeing. I mean, he just looks. He was looking like he was having a lot of pain in matches, you know. And that's just never good. Yeah, so, yeah for sure. Hopefully, for sure. he gets better. Next up was the Women of Honor title match. Kelly Klein defeated champion Mayu Iwatani in ten and a half minutes. Uh, I thought the match myself was no good. I thought my Iwatani looked good, but Kelly Klein moves in like slow motion. And she's not very well coordinated. Her footwork is bad. And she has like the worst faux MMA gimmick ever. It just, it's not believable in any way. I, I'm not going to lie and say I paid attention to this match i said it in the preview i think roh d- does not care about this division and that they only are booking this division because they feel obligated through fan pressure and whatnot to have a women's division they clearly have no actual thought put into it of wanting to make it any type of legitimate division and and to give these ladies a a real chance and i i think that was even more obvious after the post-match angle and yeah i i didn't i didn't really pay attention to this match i guess kelly klein won so cool good for yeah no good and speaking of the post-match angle how dare you say they aren't taking the women's division (laughs) seriously because angelina love and velvet sky arrived This was an idea that Madison Rain suggested before she left. Um, It was turned down. And basically what they did is they put the lizard man's girlfriend, Mandy Leone, with them. They came out and confronted Kelly Klein. Mandy Leone came out like she was going to help her. It was the old Vince Russo swerve. She attacked the new champion. They laid her out. They laid out Jenny Rose and Steli Gray. And the crowd shit all over it. Because it's a beautiful people reboot in 2019. Velvet Sky's horrible in the ring. Mandy Leone's horrible in the ring. Angelina Love can be okay at times. And it felt like the biggest step backwards. Because nobody, nobody that actually pays for an ROH ticket or goes to an ROH show wants to see Velvet Sky. They want to see Mayu Iwatane and other women from stardom and good women's wrestlers. They don't want a throwback to an old TNA idea that feels like just like the worst rehash of the Attitude Era women. And that's, that's, like, that's, that's exactly what I was going to call it, is it felt like just a TNA thing. And, and, and I mean, it is like the beautiful people were together in TNA all those years ago. But I'm I'm saying it felt like a TNA thing, not because it's a TNA gimmick that they're using, but it's just we're out of ideas. We don't have anything to do. Oh, here's two people that used to team together that haven't been around in a while. Let's bring them in or bring them back or reunite them and get like a, a cheap pop off of that and then with actual no like planning on anything 
And that's exactly what this was. It was just, except they're doing it, like they're not only taking a TNA gimmick and doing a TNA angle, they're doing it years and years later to where it, it doesn't, it matters even less. And it it doesn't feel like something, we're going to talk about ROH uh, booking a little bit later on and I'll pick up this kind of rant where I'm going to leave it off. It just did not feel like an ROH thing. As you said, like no nobody who comes to ROH comes to see angles like this, comes to see like the beautiful people. Nobody wants to see that stuff in Ring of Honor. And I'm not saying don't do angles, don't do swerves, don't don't do reuniting and nostalgia pops and whatever, but don't do this nostalgia pop because one it didn't get any type of pop and and don't do like just with these people and and this is why i say there's no actual thought in this division they they they're not going to give these ladies a chance to to be wrestlers they're they're taking two ladies basically from the divas era um i mean velvet sky's never been good in the ring the angelina love is as you said been passable i can't say i've seen enough of mandy leone but i, I trust your horrible um, <laughs> she's I, so bad i trust your judgment on that and it's just like the these women are more divas than than superstars to use a couple of wwe terms but that that's what this felt like like this felt like a wwe thing except it felt like a tna thing which means it was wwe extra 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 light yeah and people are going to be wondering like why would they bring in velvet sky and blah 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 well and it's going to transition and segue into our next segment here bully ray according to reports has slowly but surely gained a lot of power backstage in ring of honor And apparently he has a lot of creative say, which explains a lot lately. Mega Rand came out to perform his going to the garden bullshit. Bully Ray interrupted, ran him off. It was time for the Bully Ray open challenge, but Juice Robinson had been laid out backstage. And we were informed that the New York State Athletic Commission would not let him perform. And then Flip Gordon made his return. Flip looked in really good shape, uh, trimmed on, was looking cut, wearing some new, uh, he's wearing the long long tights now, uh, looked good, and he accepted the challenge, and we got a match for a little bit, and it was going okay, and then Silas Young and Shane Taylor arrived, they beat the shit out of Flip, and then Juice Robinson and Mark Haskins arrived, And they said they wanted to make it a six-man, and that's what they did. They made it a big six-man clusterfuck match. And in the end, Flip Gordon and his new lifeblood pals beat Bully Ray, Silas Young, and Shane Taylor in a match that went 15 minutes. 15 minutes. And I'm going to be really annoyed because it really didn't need to go that long. It was, like, the entire Bully Ray segment was 20 minutes on this show. While you have guys like Suzuki and Ishii stuck on the pre-show, and that the junior heavyweights can't even get 10 fucking minutes. Now, granted, the junior heavyweights kicked the shit out of their match in, like, 8 minutes, but it's the fact that they shouldn't have had to. But you got Bully Ray and his pals going 15 minutes. The good guys won, which was nice, but... Yeah, it was it was okay. Jeremy, your thoughts? I hated everything about this. <laughs> Every single minute of this, I hated. the The Mega Ran thing was just so out of place, and I actually like. I don't have an issue with Mega Ran. I don't know the guy. From what I understand, he's a very nice guy and he's a legitimate wrestling fan. And, you know, he wrote this song about going to the garden. Good on him. It was it was just this crowd wanted nothing to do with it because why? Why would they? It, it felt like, you know, one of those WrestleMania performances where, hey, we got this musical act who needs to perform their song and you know except it's not 
it's not Kid Rock, who I know people have their opinions on Kid Rock, but he was one of the biggest musical acts in the world when he was playing mm-hmm. WrestleMania. It's Mega Ran, who is fine, but I guarantee you most people have, have not heard of him. And so he comes out and does that. And then like Bully Ray comes out and interrupts and Bully Ray gets cheered. He gets cheered by this crowd who is supposed to hate him because that's how much no one wanted this Mega Ran performance. And then he, you know, he cuts his promo, does whatever. It's Flip Gordon, which we talked about on the preview that that Flip Gordon thing, I, I had suspicions that it was the work because they really botch that whole thing if you look back at it. and this just shows you like they don't there doesn't seem to be a really great long-term plan because flip always made sense as the the mystery opponent here the guy to answer the challenge here and, but then they announced that he was cleared they announced that he was going to be on the baltimore show and then they were like oh shit you know it'd probably be a bigger pop if he's just back and no one's expecting it but we've already announced it, so what are we supposed to do? Oh, his knee locked up, and now he might be out six months, depending on what the MRI says. So now people won't expect him. And then he shows up. Like again, there was no actual foresight into we can say this guy is still injured and then get the big pop out of that. It's just he's back, and eh, maybe he's not back because this was supposed to be our plan. We just screwed it all up. And then, yeah, Silas Young and Shane Taylor come out. Who cares? And then Juice Robinson, who was laid out and not medically fit to compete five minutes ago, is now all of a sudden just fine and showing no ill effects of of anything. So he's he's just good to go. And here he is with Mark, Mark Haskins, and they have a six-man tag, and whatever. They do some stuff and then flip and then win, and... I hated everything about this. None of it made sense. There was no actual continuity to it. There was no, like, it was just so all over the place as well. This had no redeeming quality to me. Yeah, I, I think, like, one thing that bothered me, and I, I don't disagree with you at all, but what um what really bothered me was, like, you know, like you said, like, five minutes ago, they're like, the Athletic Commission will not clear Flip Gordon. He's off the show. Or um, Juice Robinson. It's like, okay. And then all of a sudden, Juice walks out, fresh as a fucking daisy in his street clothes. I'm like, can you not, like, 1985 NWA this for me and put, like, a fucking bloody bandage on his head or something? You know, he don't he doesn't have to gig or anything. Just fucking throw some food coloring on the bitch. And, you know, like, make it like, you know, because he got laid out backstage. Make it look serious. But it was just like, no, he's okay. He's okay, folks. No problem. He didn't die. And it's just like, you know, give me something. Because then at least he's coming out like an injured baby face. And, you know, you can maybe, you know, have a little sympathy for him. But, yeah, it just, uh, it didn't work. And, again, the whole Holy Race I've been going 20 minutes on this show was just horrible. Just horrible. You know, so it's loaded as ass. <laughs> well, we'll talk about. I'll, I'll get into my bully ray booking rant a little bit later. But this this sucked to me. Just absolutely killed the complete momentum of this show. Like the crowd. Again, you got bully ray cheered in the easiest spot to get him booed ever, and. You, they just did everything wrong in this segment. Literally everything wrong to me. Like there, there's again no redeeming qualities uh, in this segment for me. Yeah, the show came to a screeching halt between the women's match and that segment because just with the women's match, you had the beautiful people thing in there, or allure, or whatever the fuck they're to be called, and then you had the bully Ray stuff, and then it picked back up. New Japan to the rescue, IWGP Junior Heavyweight Title match. Dragon Lee defeats Taiji Ishimori and Bandito to become the new champion uh, in 8.55, which was fucking criminal. But it was a great fucking sprint. Thank God for this match to pick the show back up. It did suck that it went less than 10 minutes, but they packed in a lot of action. 
in that less than 10 minutes. Um, just the, the, the show needed it after the last couple of segments. Like, the show really needed this match, and these guys delivered much to their credit. Jagan Lee winning is... I said it. I, I said beforehand that I thought Dragon Lee was going to win, and then of course the big rumor has been Hiromu has been cleared and that he would be there, and so you would think, okay, Dragon Lee wins, Hiromu confronts him, and it felt like the crowd was waiting for that, and then it just it never it never came out. Uh, Hiromu was was never you know never showed up, and the crowd felt a little deflated when you could you know no music hit. Everybody just kind of went to the back, and that was the end of that. Um, and I'm not saying, like, New Japan screwed this up. Like, they never promised Hiromu. It's just something that fans, including myself, had sort of built up. And when you see Dragon Lee winning, it would seem to be the perfect spot for it to happen. And it just didn't happen. And, you know, again, Hiromu being healthy and getting back is is more important than – or being healthy is more important than getting back – uh, so if he's not healthy, don't don't rush anything like that. Uh, again, but this match, thank God it happened when it did because it felt like the crowd was really just ready to turn on everything. And then these guys came in there with a nine minute sprint and and picked everything back up. Yeah, it, it um, I I really enjoyed it. I thought they did the absolute best they could do in the time given to them. I thought it was great. Really enjoyed and. I think it was Meltzer had this idea. Is like, even if they weren't going to bring Hiromu out, I think it was him that said they should have done something like after the match where like the lights go out, and then like Daryl pops up on the screen with like a coming soon, because everybody knows Hiromu and the stuff cat Daryl. You know, it's like just yeah, they even cut to, to like they cut to Daryl somebody with not the Daryl, uh, but somebody with like a Daryl um, plush toy. Uh, like after the match or before the next match or something to sort of like tease that a little bit more and like if Hiromu is close to being back then then fine you could do something like that I don't know what Hiromu's actual status is the the reports are just all over the place and yeah like, like Dave was saying oh he's gonna be back for 47th anniversary and then it was oh he's gonna be back for new japan cup finals and oh it's gonna be back for the garden show now i'm sure the report is he's gonna be back for best of super juniors like it's been two three four months now and he hasn't like there's been no inkling that he's actually back and i know he's been posting updates on his twitter that he's at like three thousand percent but it's Hiromu. you never know with that guy so if he's not close to being back you obviously don't want to tease it and give fans the idea that he's going to be back soon and he's not going to be back soon yeah and again hopefully he is he really is doing that well and hopefully you know if he does get to come back everything's going to be cool i um i like i don't think it'll be this i i just like I almost worry a little bit because, like, you see, you've seen Hanma come back, and he's just so bad right now. And I just, I'm, I'm like, I'm hoping Hiromu's okay. He can move around. I'm hoping he's going to be a little more careful. Now, granted, he didn't do anything stupid that got him injured. It was a complete accident, and those things happen. But again, that's the a style stupid he move. If we're being honest. Well, like, I, mean, I, I know he's taken it before and i know people do it and everything uh, that's still a a very you know risky move to take yeah it is but i just i hope he's careful when he comes back and everything's gonna be cool but yeah but it was a great little sprint i was happy with it next up we moved on to another title match roh and iwgp tag titles on the line the iwgp tag team champions the girl is a destiny defeated ROH Tag Team Champions PCO and Brody King, as well as the Briscoes, E1 Sonata. They now hold both championships. This was uh, just shy of 10 minutes. I thought they did really good for the time given. Again, it was needed. The junior match was great. And then this was... I thought this was really good. Not great, but really good. I thought everybody got a chance to play their role as well. And... I have no fucking clue how PCO isn't dead. (laughs) That poor bastard near the finish. Near the finish is this. The gorillas of destiny start to beat the shit out of PCO. They pick him up 
and they powerbomb him over the top rope and straight to the floor. Not through a table, not onto a ladder, not onto some chairs. Nope, straight from the ring, splat on the mat. And then they took out Brody King with the Super Bomb in the ring and won the titles. Uh, very good, very fun. Uh, I thought uh, Girls of Destiny would win, and I'm um, glad PCA is not dead. I, I enjoyed this match. I, I thought it was very good as well. As you said, everyone played their role. Everyone got some shine in this match, and it's they, another match where they packed in a lot of action to a limited amount of time completely with you on the pco thing i was in a chat with some people and i was just like holy fuck and they're like what and i was like dude that pco spot like how can you like how does he take something like that and then he tries to you know tries to rise from the dead and then he falls back down like yeah you shouldn't be getting up after that shit that that looked like it sucked completely like god bless this guy for doing it i he's carved out a niche for himself i i will say that he he was i mean this time last year you know he was completely off the radar and then he has the Volter match and now like he's in roh he's wrestling at the garden again and he's completely reinvented himself and he's one of like the biggest cult figures in wrestling right now. So God bless the guy. I, he doesn't need to be taking that spot, but God bless him for taking it. Um, girls of destiny winning is, is, is fine. Um, I, I like them. They're, I, they're not great, uh, but I like kind of their characters and I, I don't know th- this was a weird one because I don't know if you're going to like see too much of them in ROH, even though, you know, they have more ties to like being in America than um, evil and Sonata. And I don't know if the Briscoes are going to Japan and PCO could maybe not go to Japan. So it it was a weird one where the, the winner was sort of up for grabs and where you were not quite sure what was going to make sense. I can't imagine they're going to hold the titles for very long. And maybe they, you know, maybe they end up losing them to, um, to, to juice and, and somebody else, um, you know, in new Japan, since juice is going to work new Japan and then juice can just bring them back to ROH since he also works in ROH that, you know, like you get the ROH titles on lifeblood through, through that means, but do the match in new Japan, uh, we'll we'll see where it goes, but yeah, I, I enjoyed this match um, for what it was. Yeah, and uh, you know, I, I think that definitely a possibility of a title change in early May with the uh, the joint shows happening too. So yeah, we'll see we'll see who steps up, and uh, there could be you know it could be one of the life the, uh, could be a tandem from Lifeblood. Uh, I wouldn't rule out um, possibly Jay Lethal and Gresham. Because they're really good, and with Jay Lethal not being world champion anymore, I could, I could definitely deal with him and Gresham being a longer term tag team. But uh, the big news was not the fact that the Grills of Destiny won the tag titles. The fact was after the match, ROH went Russo with a work shoot angle because Enzo and Cass were at ringside. And here's how you know: first of all, it was a work. Because they sat there and talked shit. They jumped the rail. There was no security around. And magically, Bully Ray's out there. <laughs> yeah, th- this is this is where I'm going to get into my Bully Ray has more power uh, Go to it. rant here. <laughs> the, this show, like when you find out later on after the show that Hey, by the way, Bully Ray is kind of having more say with the decisions that go on. And you look back at the ROH portion of this show. Yes, you see it 100%. Like, you kind of know the type of personality, the type of booker Bully Ray would be if he was given the pencil. And this show, like, really shows it. Like, let's do a TNA Vince Russo swerve. Let me get my my girlfriend Velvet Sky 
on this show and take care of her. Let me have my segment go 20 minutes where none of it makes any sense, but I, you know, I still get all of this time and take away time from the more important matches. Let's do this work shoot angle with, with uh, Enzo and Cass, but I have to be out there for literally no reason outside of, Oh, it's a shoot. And why wouldn't I come out there to fight these guys? Like the fucking Briscoes could have beat up Enzo and Cass on their own. That's how you knew it was an angle, by the way, because if Enzo and Cass really got into a fight with the Briscoes, we, the Enzo and Cass would be in the hospital because the Briscoes would whoop their ass. They have fought bigger and badder men than fucking Enzo Amore. Um, and then the to cap it all off, spoiler alert, Matt Taven winning. Like, what's if you had to say Bully Ray, who is your ideal champion? It would be a guy who is quote unquote a legitimate heat machine but who draws heat and who gets the crowd against them and matt taven is uh one way or another the biggest heel in the company whether you think it's x-pac heat or whether you think it's actual heat like he does draw the most heat in the company and so bully ray looks at that and be like he's the top heel he's got to hold the belt he pisses off the crowd you know he he talks shit to the crowd and he gets them against him and nobody likes this guy that's the guy you want as your champion that's money this show just had bully ray's fingerprints all over it from top to bottom the roh portion obviously from top to bottom and you can just and this Enzo and Cass worked shoot like I guess they're coming in there now and they're gonna be part of the the the, the fucking company and it's like why why do you need these guys why would anybody want these guys like Cass Cass is not very good like WWE put him with Daniel Bryan and he couldn't do anything with Daniel fucking Bryan. Enzo is he can talk and again this is a bully ray thing he can cut a promo I don't really care how he wrestles he can cut a promo he can't wrestle we know he can't wrestle and it's once again bully ray he draws heat though the crowd doesn't like him he can rail on the crowd and get that legitimate heat like it just everything about this show was just completely bully ray just all over it and if you're just an ROH fan, if you're a fan of like you want that pure ROH, like great wrestling, you know, Bully Ray did a promo or not a promo, uh, an interview prior to this show and saying like ROH needs an identity. They need to be more unpredictable. Bully Ray's identity for ROH and more unpredictable basically means rehashing ECW attitude era stuff that worked really well then, but just doesn't work the same way in 2019, mainly because you're not using the right guys for it. Like Enzo, Cass, Matt Taven, the beautiful people, yourself, those are not the right guys. And again, if you're an ROH fan and you just like really good wrestling that ROH has provided over the years with all the stars that have come and gone in that company, it, it's not going to be like that anymore with Bully Ray at the helm. Like you're really getting watered down TNA stuff right now. Random. Yeah. I just, and the worst part is too, is like, okay, Cass has put on like a ton of weight since he got his release. He's worked almost no matches. Enzo has worked no matches, period. So when you have people get released from WWE, you generally have like two kinds of people. You have the Cody Rhodes, the Trent Barrettas, the Juice Robinsons. You know, they either choose to leave or they get released. And they go out there to prove a point. They take a shit ton of bookings. They try to improve. And, you know, like look at you know Trent Barretta and Juice are guys that people thought nothing of when they left. And they've done really, really well for themselves. Cody has done excellent for himself. So you got those kind of guys. And then you got guys like Ryback. Who, yeah, this this has got me blocked by Ryback on a column I wrote about him. He doesn't like me <laughs> on Twitter. See, fuck that guy. But yeah, you have <laughs> guys like Ryback who are charging way too much money, 
because quote unquote they want to weed out the companies that don't pay. No, that's you set a price because you don't want to work. You know, so Th- he fucking is, does it. Yeah, this he's is done a- more. He's done more podcasts <laughs> than wrestling matches since his release. This is. We were both, I believe, like fairly like high on Ryback, all things considered, when he left WWE. Like he was doing the flyback gimmick and it was kind of cool. And he wasn't like the matches with Kalisto, and I understand that's Kalisto, but like his matches weren't bad. And we really thought, like, hey, this guy on the indies, you know, the the chains are off or whatever, and he can go out there and maybe have some good matches and stuff. And the column that I wrote that got me blocked by him was basically a a compare and contrast with him and Cody Rhodes because they were released around the same time. And, you know, Ryback goes out and, and does absolutely nothing with, with his independent run. He makes a couple of appearances and then really just does a bunch of podcasts. Cody Rhodes. Meanwhile, he makes his list. He's like, this is all the shit that I want to accomplish. And he goes out there and he accomplishes all that. And like, I mean, way more than that. He he has his own wrestling company now. And keep in mind, Cody Rhodes, like his independent run to start with. And I still don't think like he's not this fantastic wrestler. Like there's no indication that the WWE style held him back in the ring. He was just, he's a good wrestler, a good hand. But he went out there and he wrestled all these matches. He went to all these companies. He went to all uh, these countries. And he, you know, he busted his ass on everything and learned every, soaked up every piece of information he could. Got, you know, met people, hung out with people who had that same drive that he did. And now, like, he's an executive vice president of a major wrestling company right now. And you look at the difference between what he did with his career after leaving WWE and what a guy like Ryback did, who everyone said, oh, this guy's underused. Like, this guy, he's underrated. He's having these good matches right now. He should be doing more. They should have put the title on him during the CM Punk reign, and they probably should have. But you see why maybe, yeah, we, WWE, we were right to not really do as much with this guy because they're, that drive and everything is not, there and it's the same thing with a guy like Enzo with a guy like Cass like they get released what did they actually do once they were released Enzo makes a terrible rap album I know Cass tried to do wrestling but he like he got completely out of shape so the the drive just wasn't there for those guys and but they're gonna get a chance in ROH because Bully Ray has the pencil and they draw heat, brother. The thing is, is too, is I don't see them trying. I see them looking at this ROH thing like a lot of guys looked at TNA, like it's a paid vacation. I don't see them putting in effort. I no. don't see them being willing to really work with some of the guys they're going to be asked to work with. And I just, I see bad things happening. So, but anyway, while all this was going on, Toriyanu snuck down and stole the IWGP tag titles which on one of the upcoming shows here this month, he and Makabe are going to be challenging the girls of Destiny for the tag titles. So at least we got that out of all that bullshit. So we will move on to the, the Rev Pro British Heavyweight title, champion Zack Sabre Jr. defeating Hiroshi Tanahashi. I, I thought Tanahashi might take this one, but uh, Zack was like, fuck off, old man. And he tortured him with submissions for 15 and a half minutes. And uh, finally got him to give up at the end. Um, pretty much the usual great match from these two. And again, um, outside of the Enzo and Cass thing, this was another example. The show was turning around. It was going better. And uh, I really enjoyed this one. These two can, I love when they wrestle. They can do it all the time as far as I'm concerned. I think we both had... Um... Tanahashi possibly picking up the victory here and then rematching Saber at the Royal Quest show. I don't know if they knew, because obviously we know now that Tanahashi is injured. 
and like he's not even wrestling on the Dentaku shows. I don't know if they knew like how severe the injury was prior to this match and they just figured, well, we don't really want to do this because if you put this title on Tanahashi, he's probably got to show up at, at one Rev Pro event and defend it at least once. Um, so, and, and if he's injured, obviously it's it's tough to defend that title. So I don't know how much they knew about the injury going into this match. If if or if he'd suffered the injury in this match, like who knows? Uh, but Zack Saber Jr. winning is still like I'm completely fine with it. I, I love this guy. I love Zack Saber time, uh, and he beats fucking Tanahashi again. He's got a fairly good record against Tanahashi. I feel like um, so. Yeah, good good match. It's it's always going to be tough to have a bad match with uh, Zack Saber because the guy is just he's so smooth. He knows exactly what he's doing in there. Just his style makes it. Like, he's not going to botch a bunch of stuff. Not that, like, botches are kind of less common nowadays for, for top performers anyway. But he, he's not going to mess up oh, really anything because of just how smooth he is with the transitions. And Tanahashi is he's fucking Tanahashi. Yeah, and the thing is, too, like you said, Zach is so smooth. And Tanahashi's match layouts are always so smart. And you, you kind of put all that together. And, you know, I... You keep hearing Tanahashi lost a step, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, he is banged up. But the thing is, is his match layouts are so smart. He knows what his opponent can do. And more importantly, he's smart enough to know his own limitations. Like, that's one thing we always talked about when uh, Jericho was having his last run in WWE. And it was like, why are you trying to work like 1997 Chris Jericho still? And thankfully, when he went and did the New Japan stuff, he really figured it out that, you know, I need to be different. I need to change. And he was working that like bruiser Brody brawler gimmick basically. And it worked really great for him there. So it's like, you have to know your limitations sometimes. And thankfully Tanahashi is smart enough to know that, but yeah, another great match. And yeah, Zach has a, has a rather good record against the ace. And uh, he's going to be challenging Kota Ibushi for the IC title coming up here. And uh, that should be a good one. Yeah, uh, yeah, any Zack Saber match, I'm I'm a fan of. And speaking of, like I said, Intercontinental Champion Kota Ibushi defeated Tatsuya Naito in a, just under 21 minutes via pin, and we have a new Intercontinental Champion. Kota Ibushi finally gets the monkey off his back, and finally not only lives up to his quote-unquote gods and Nakamura and Tanahashi, but the thing is, is yes, everybody knows Kota Ibushi is a great wrestler, but there is that fan perception of him kind of being a choke artist in the major title matches to where he's failed repeatedly. And he finally beats Naito, who is obviously a big main event star. He beat him again because he had beat him in the New Japan Cup. He wins the title. And now you can go forward. I think there's going to be a better support of Ibushi going forward simply for the fact that people can buy him as one of those main top guys now. And, you know, a couple of years ago in New Japan, it was like the top three was um, Tanahashi, Okada, and Nakamura. And now you have a bigger mix because you have, you have um, Okada, you still have Tanahashi around, you have Ibushi, you have Naito, you have Jay White up there. So it's been expanded now, and that's only good for the company. And again, Kota Ibushi with the belt, working guys like Naito and Zack Sabre Jr., never going to turn that down. It's it's tough to have a bad match with when you throw Ibushi and Naito in there against each other. Um, the Ibushi story of him being a choke artist is a is a good point and you you can only build a story like that obviously if he loses a lot of these top matches and then so when he does win a match like this it does end up meaning a little bit more because it's like this guy's failed repeatedly now he overcomes all that now he's the champion now the crowd is behind him even more so uh the I'm sure that I don't know if that was like the long term story they were trying to tell. I think it's more of we didn't put a title on this guy because he wasn't really under contract to us, but it ended up working out. I, I'm still more interested in kind of the 
Naito story because you go back to, to Wrestle Kingdom last year when he lost to Okada and then he lost in the New Japan Cup and then the G1. And, um, you know, he just kept losing all of these big matches. And then, okay, he comes back and he beats Jericho um, for the for the IC title. And so you, you get to do that. Um, but, you know, he, he's still losing all of the all of these matches and now he's he's losing in the new japan cup again now he's losing the ic title to ibushi he never really cared about the ic title and never like took it as this belt means anything and like we both agree that it's being set up he's gonna end up going to the tokyo dome and challenging okada and but he keeps losing these matches like i'm expecting sort of a, a big kind of g run g1 run from him out of out of all of this and we'll we'll see just kind of where the naito story goes because that's a that's a story that i can really sink my teeth into of the this guy is not taking some stuff too serious here and he keeps losing all these big matches is he still the same naito like is it time to not be quite as tranquilo so we'll have to see as far as the match goes it was excellent they did I said there's no botches and like high profile matches and then of course there in this one the whole uh cradle tombstone kind of got messed up a little bit and they they managed to save it a little bit but it was very clear that they, that wasn't how it was supposed to go it not that it like killed the match completely it's just very rare you see two guys at this level mess up something in that spot um and then Ibushi wins and I'm looking forward to the IC title reign of Ibushi because while Maito didn't care about the title, didn't take it serious, whatever, I think Ibushi is going to be like very much the opposite of that. Agreed. Yeah, then that that's going to be the one of the big differences is, you know, this actually it meant something to Ibushi because, like I said, his whole thing was he wanted to be on the level of his gods. That he and this is not like a joke. That's what he calls Nakamura and Tanahashi. So he wanted to be on that level, and he saw the Intercontinental title as the first step to getting there. So he finally won it, and uh, yeah, it's it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, I think Naito is in in store for a huge G1 run as well, and I, I still think that him and uh, Okada at the Dome is a, I wouldn't say a certain, but I would say it's a huge possibility. Just because, I mean, I know Gato books everything like three years in advance, but I don't have his notebook, so I don't know. So we will move on to the Ring of Honor World Title match, which was a ladder match. Matt Taven defeated Jay Lethal and Marty Skrull to become the new champion in just under 30 minutes. It was a long one, kids. It it certainly was. I didn't find this match bad. Or anything like they had some some cool spots taven winning is again i it, it's a bully ray thing i think it's fairly obvious it's a bully ray thing i neither of us are fans of matt taven i will give him credit in saying this match was good and the jay lethal match a couple weeks ago was was very good so but granted those had those had some smoke and mirrors. I mean, this one was obviously a ladder match, and the the other one had some kind of bigger spots, and all was also against Jay Lethal, who was just awesome. Um, you know, we'll see kind of how he can do on the the day to day carrying the company, and it sucks that his first feud is going to be against Kenny King. It like it feels like he's maybe not his first feud, but he's going to have a match with Kenny King that's going to head on a show at some point. And it feels like he's almost being set up to fail in that regard. Uh, Taven winning, it just, it feels so nothing. Like giving Jay Lethal this moment would have been better. Like Lethal's title run has been really good. He's, I mean, he's Jay Lethal. He can have these great matches. Really Marty Skrull, this should have been his spot. Like you've built this guy up. You've given him... Uh, kind of henchman as the villain Skrull is one of your bigger stars like he is the the holdover from the elite so you know he's he's got that going for him as well and I guess maybe they're hesitant to 
put the belt on him because they don't know when he's going to leave or if he's going to leave. But you've got to do something to inspire your audience and give them confidence. And, and putting the title on Matt Taven doesn't really feel like the move. Yeah, and that's the thing. I saw a lot of people going, well, you can't expect them to put the title on Marty. He's going to be leaving soon. And people keep thinking he's leaving like right now. He still has a couple months on his contract. Yeah, to exactly. Me, to me, I would have put the title on him because he still does. He still has, like you said, that elite connection. He still feels like he's a star. And he's over. I mean, you know, Matt Taven did some nice heel things in this match. He took some good bumps. He works hard. I have no problem with that, but I just I don't see Matt Taven as like the world champion. And you know what? I hope he proves me wrong. Because I don't want the company to have bad problems with, you know, the world champion and then like them not drawing well and stuff like that. I hope Matt Taven proves me wrong. I hope he has a bunch of great matches. But it's just I don't know. Yeah, here's the thing. If Marty's leaving in a couple months, put the title on him. You get what you can out of him. Milk what you can out of him. Try to get some crowds. Try to make some money. Try to make a star. Because maybe later on, whoever beats him will be better off, even if it was Taven in a few months. But the thing is, you try to get what you can out of the guy. And maybe, maybe, just maybe, maybe he resigns with you. You never know. I mean, it's highly unlikely because he's probably going to want to go with all of his friends, and there's nothing wrong with that. But... Why not take the chance? That, that tape is not going anywhere. That's my thinking as well. Is one, you're absolutely correct that he's not leaving tomorrow. So it's not like you're putting the title on him and then you're getting a, a Montreal screw job where he's gonna leave with the title or anything like that. And, and two, show some confidence in this guy and give him a reason to stay. He, he, as you said, he's probably going to All Elite because he wants to be with his friends and he's probably he's gonna make more money there and all the there's there's more incentive to just join All Elite Wrestling. But at least make the decision difficult for him. If you like if you're ROH right now and you're coming up to Marty Skrull and you're like, hey, here's what we can offer you. You know, what do you think? And and Marty Skrull is looking at this and saying, like, you guys didn't show any faith in me. Like, if you're ROH, you're, you're better off saying, hey, you know, like, we gave you this big win at Madison Square Garden. We put the title on you. We showed this confidence in you. We can build this company around you. We gave you PCO and Brody King, two guys who we have high hopes for. Like, we... We're showing that we can and want to build around you. You go to All Elite Wrestling, all right, you'll be with your friends and you'll probably make more money and like great. And again, this is why he's probably going. But you're second fiddle to Cody, the Bucks, and Omega. Like oh, they gave you Okada. You kind of screwed that up with the timing. Uh, I, and I'm not privy to how they really feel about that. I'm sure it's water under the bridge at this point. But you're not the top guy in all elite wrestling. You're, you're the top guy in ROH. We've proven that we will make you our top guy. Even when we weren't sure you would be sticking around with us, we showed that faith in you. What do you say? And if you're Skrull, you you think about it at least. You're not just like, eh, no, like I'm going to blow that off. Like there's good valid points of like, yeah, you know what? They they make some, they have some interesting things to say here. Now, if you're ROH, you just go to this guy and be like, here's our offer. It's less than what all elite's going to give you. We put you in that Madison Square Garden match, but we didn't give you the one-on-one -on -one match, even though you kind of earned that. And then we still had you lose to Matt Taven. And all right, we gave you PCO and Brody King, but, you know, whatever. They're just kind of guys, I guess. They, they did themselves no favors by just... They basically gave up on retaining Marty Skrull. And that's fine if you don't think you're going to get him. But it's also a disservice to your fans, I feel like, in that this is a guy that your fans want to see win this title. This is a guy who you... And it's a one-off thing. He wins, he can lose it. Before he leaves, it's fine. You still gave them something for this show instead of we're giving you Matt Taven. 
Yeah, I think the worst part is is this was a second chance for them with him too. Cuz they didn't put the title on him last year. And they had a chance and he was hot last year and they were lucky he stayed that hot for another year. And then it was this like, mm, uh, mm, nope, nope, we're good. And it, like you said, they they've given him no reason to to consider staying, to make him feel important, to make him second guess any decisions. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's not going to be a surprise if he bails here in a couple months. You know, uh, I'm good. Peace out. Can hang out with my friends. You know, dating Deanna Perrazzo. I have a good life. Peace out. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I didn't think it was bad either. Um, I, I actually saw some people have the fucking nutsack to try to say that, oh, this was this was just as good as Sean and Razor. Like, what? W- what are you watching? No, no. <laughs> there's, there's the only ladder match that's as good as Sean and Razor is Sean and Razor 2. No, it's just, yeah, it was... It was not bad. It was just, it was good. And just, it, it was missing something. I thought it had uh, too many dead spots, a little too much setting up things. And, uh, you know, Taven won, and there you go. So that leads us to the real main event. Because Chico Okada defeating Jay White to win the IWGP Heavyweight Championship. And uh, after losing to White a few times, Okada finally gets the monkey on his back and closes the door for now. And he is our champion once again. The first part of this match was certainly kind of slow, um, to to say the least. I had a I had a hard time sort of getting into the the first part of this match, and I think the crowd did too. The crowd really felt like they were waiting for something like big to happen and to really like get hooked into the match. And then it just kind of never did. They just went through the paces and, and I'm not saying this is right or wrong. Like this kind of, I think if you kind of put this match in the, uh, in the Tokyo dome or any new Japan um, place, it, it, it works a little bit better because just it's a it's a different audience. Let's be honest, it, it's just a different audience. Uh, but but for this crowd, it, they they had a hard time sort of getting into that kind of slower pace at first. But once it picked up, it really picked up. And and Jay White continues to be very good, probably underrated. And I mean, Okada is Okada. The the title change here was fairly expected. I would say you want to send kind of these garden fans home happy with everything and i mean the talk was that okada was gonna win the title here regardless whether it was jay white kenny omega hiroshi tanahashi it didn't seem like it was gonna matter okada was winning here so uh but really good match if the first uh, 10 minutes or so were, were trimmed down then maybe better or if the if it was just in front of a a japanese audience instead of uh this crowd maybe even better as well because the crowd just they just wanted to go crazy for something after everything they'd seen and this was another long show and it's hard to get up at the end for these long shows even if you are excited about what you're seeing and they they did not give them a reason to be like hey go crazy for this at the at the very beginning of this match yeah, and uh, yeah, I think um, I I think that you're right that it was mostly expected the title change, and um, I I think it's a good way to wrap up this the Jay White story for now because obviously both guys aren't going anywhere. Both guys are really young. There's going to be more later on, but the fact is is you know Okada wins and people were like. Oh, LOL, Okada wins. Okay, yeah, I, I get it. That maybe you didn't want him to win, but it does wrap up the story. And then, um, you know, we're going to see where things go from here in terms of overall challengers and everything. But, um, yeah, it's um, I think it was a fine move. And I think it was important for him to win the title too in MSG because you wanted that really big moment, like you said. 
And then I think that the important thing was from the New Japan side of the card, it really felt like New Japan was really focused on giving a New Japan experience to those fans as much as they could in the United States, you know? So, and that's where I think that they really excelled. And then, like, we've talked about, you have the booking issues with ROH, questionable choices, talent, booking, and, yeah, definitely a tale of two shows. I thought it was a good show overall, mostly based on the the strength of the New Japan side of it, because I thought there was a lot of great wrestling from the New Japan side. And uh, just the ROH side was okay to good with a lot of questionable booking stuff. But the crossover title versus title matches were both quality stuff, so that helped them a little bit. But yeah, it's um, it was a good show, but yeah, it's... It it could have been and should have been a lot better, I think. The the bringing the whole New Japan experience to America that was something that uh, Okada and Tanahashi talked about last year. With you know when they come to America and, and do these shows, it felt like an American show just with the New Japan name. Like most of the shows were headlined by the elite guys. They kind of did that stuff like Okada and these guys were like sometimes just stuck in like six man tags and everything. And like, it didn't feel like, Hey, this is a big new Japan show in America. This is an elite show in America with new Japan guys on it. And this one was with the elite guys gone. It definitely felt much different. It felt like, Hey, this is a new Japan card. This is, a um a i don't i want to say it's a wrestle kingdom but this is a dantaku show or um a power struggle show or something like that like you're getting big new japan matches on this show for this card and yeah in that sense like it really did deliver like the new japan side of this card was great it was just classic new japan wrestling um I, I say classic and then say 2019, but it, it was just what you would expect New Japan to be in 2019. And so from that aspect, it was great. And then the ROH show was, I guess, where ROH is going in 2019. And as I said earlier, if that's, if you're an ROH fan, that's scary watching the ROH portion of this show because it wasn't good um I, some of the wrestling was good but really if you look at it the the wrestling was good because of the, there was new japan involvement as well like just look at the roh matches and you're you're looking at the women of honor match which wasn't good at all the post-match angle sucked um you're you're looking at roosh and, and dalton castle which was great for what it was admittedly like that that was perfect in that spot and and for that moment and just everything they want to do uh the 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 title versus title match with osprey and cobb you know part of that is do japan we'll have to see where kind of cobb goes at that point the the honor rumble they like the, the roh guys got nothing uh, as far as crowd reaction goes and then kenny king wins it the the tie the tag title match featured new japan guys the big roh thing out of that was the post-match angle which was god awful and and terrible and you're using enzo and cast now and then the bully ray the bully ray segment was i told you i didn't find anything good about that entire segment and the world title match was good but then you put the title on matt taven who just doesn't feel like your world champion now and it doesn't feel like he's going to be the guy. This is the guy that's carrying the company. So the ROH portion of this show was just, it wasn't good at all. And their television on most weeks is just very not great. It's, you know, five weeks behind. We'll see how Matt Taven does as the champion four weeks from now, whenever their next tell, I think they're holding television tapings this weekend, but those yep. shows won't air for like four weeks because they still have all the Vegas shows to air. So it's just, uh, I feel bad if you're a big ROH fan in 2019. The 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 future does not look good right now. Yeah, apparently, according to PW Insider, the ROH creative team right now is Kevin Eck, Joey Matthews, 
Delirious, Todd St. Clair, and Bully Ray. <sighs> good, good luck. I mean, as I said, this show, the ROH portion, has Bully Ray's fingerprints all over it, and that's probably probably not a good thing. Like, I know the guy has experience. I know he's got good relationships with a lot of people. I know he can pick the brains of a lot of smart people. We've never really seen him with the with booking power, so we don't quite know how that's going to work out. But we know just the kind of person he is based on all of his interviews, based on, I mean, he does a radio show five days a week. We, we hear plenty of quotes from him. We know the type of angles and, and superstars he, he is looking for. And yeah, you saw it on this show. Yeah. So that is the, uh, the G1 Supercard of Honor review. Uh, like I said at the beginning, it was a, definitely a tale of two shows. Um, you know, if you're an ROH fan, I think there is reason to be not happy and trepidatious going forward. Um, a lot of questions and, um, it's just, uh, yeah, we'll see. And I saw someone, um, a bunch of comments in the comment section of my review that, Oh, ROH is going in a more sports entertainment section. It's what you all asked for. And I'm sitting there thinking, I never fucking asked for that. I, I'm doing it. You I'm fine can't... with them. Go ahead. Yeah, it's like I'm fine with them being a wrestling company that has light angles. Okay, I'm fine with that because not everybody should try to be WWE. That was TNA's problems over the year. They were always WWE light. They never had an identity as TNA. It's you know Impact Wrestling. They're trying. They're trying to get an identity, but they're still battling years of negative fans and like the support that they lost even though they're not the old tna anymore but they're linked to it so they're still fighting against it you need to try to be what you can that's why i hope aew i hope they have a nice plan laid out i hope they know what they want to do and who they want to do it with and i hope that they don't try to be someone else light you know, be your own damn company. Chikara is Chikara. Lucha Underground is Lucha Underground. You know, and again, that's why stuff like we talked about WrestleMania weekend, that's why things like Joey Janela's Spring Break and stuff have worked really good. And, you know, the Blood Sports show, because they're not every other fucking 30 shows that weekend. There's something different. They're giving you something different. It's what fans want. And it's proven that what fans want because blood sports attendance was way higher this year and the Janela shows sold out both nights. So again, you have to create an identity. And I just, um, right now it's just that I don't know what ROH is, is going to be. You can't out WWE, WWE. And I'm not saying you can't do it better because WWE does plenty of things wrong. But you you just can't out sports entertainment them. Look at like look at WrestleMania weekend. There were a lot of great shows during this past week. The the Supercard was one of them. Even I mean NXT was probably the best show of the week. But all anybody talked about afterwards is it's WrestleMania. Like WrestleMania is always going to have that spotlight. WWE is always going to have that spotlight. You just you can't out sports entertainment them because again, even if you do it better as far as an angle for angle basis or whatnot, you just don't have the funds to compete on that level. You don't have the production to compete on that level. So everything you do just makes it look like you're just trying to be WWE and you're, it's never going to happen. So you, you can't do that. Like ROH is best bets was to sort of just be New Japan in America, where you just have these great matches, you tell sort of these simple stories, you got an hour of TV each week to sort of build things, to sort of get get characters more established and everything. Like, you don't need to run these crazy angles. Like, TNA kind of already does this. Like, they are very sports entertainment-centric, and now TNA is kind of all over the place, but at least they're trying 
different things and trying to go in different directions. We'll see what All Elite brings to the table. Um, the Being the Elite shows are really good as far as with like establishing storylines and establishing characters. And like that's 100% no wrestling right now. ROH, again, the, this, this G1 Supercard really just felt like we're trying to be WWE with all of these things we're going to do. And we're doing it in Madison Square Garden. Fuck you, Vince. And Vince is probably just like, yeah, good good luck with that, guys, on your Sinclair broadcasting station. Yeah, exactly. It's a, It really felt like, to me, a blown opportunity for ROH. But, you know, hey, New Japan knocked it out of the park in their half of the show. And it seemed like everybody was happy with that. And, um... Yeah, so we're going to wrap up with that. Uh, Again, thank you for listening to the show. You can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Play, and YouTube, and, of course, on the 411 website. Make sure to leave us a review, follow us, subscribe, share us around on social media as we would appreciate it. I'd like to thank Jeremy for joining me as always, and everybody have a good day.